7. Make-Believe Children Oh, wicked child, what is this I hear? I thought I had hidden thee from all the world, and thou hast betrayed me. Rapunzel Every entry in my childhood diary began with, I had fun today. I am happy. I hid my true feelings completely, without realizing that I was pretending. I was faithful, obedient, easygoing, and quiet, hoping to win my mother's love. I became everything that she needed me to be. Everything except happy. Rachel was a brilliant scientist who worked for a major pharmaceutical company. Attractive, competent, and highly respected, she was dependable, faithful, obedient, and easygoing. She was everything but happy. An only child of divorced parents, Rachel lived with her mother and grandparents. Rachel described her mother as a promiscuous waif who paid little attention to her. Her mother resented Rachel and accused her of being selfish and evil. No matter how good she tried to be, Rachel could never win her mother's approval. Whenever her mother was affectionate, Rachel braced herself for the turn. In the journals she kept as an adult, Rachel recorded the painful truth. Her words can sear my soul like acid until it shrivels and turns black. All I can do is turn away. But then she accuses me of being too sensitive or misunderstanding. When she turns on me, I am flung through space and time like a lifeless object. I am no longer her child, and she is no longer my mother. I am a useless object she can throw away, a worthless piece of trash. Rachel feared that others would discover the truth about her, that she was indeed worthless. She argued, I'm not one of them. I have to work harder than everyone else. The eye beam of her soul was a fragile construction. Thus, her sense of self easily crumbled. She felt driven to excel, set unrealistic expectations for herself, and was unable to relax. She saw herself through her mother's eyes as an object that might be thrown away if she failed to make herself useful. Rachel had a recurring nightmare throughout her childhood. One minute she is playing alone in the basement, dancing in ecstasy to her favorite music, when the sound of a low growling draws her attention to the window. The piercing dark eyes of a wolf lock onto her gaze, while its fangs drip with saliva. Frozen with fear, she is unable to scream and gasps for breath. Finally, her mother appears, and Rachel points frantically at the wolf. Her mother glances at the window just at the moment the wolf disappears. What's the matter with you? Her mother scolds. There's nothing there. Knowing that she had not imagined the wolf, Rachel follows her mother up the stairs in terror of being left behind, certain of the wolf's return if she is alone. As she reaches the top of the stairs, she glances back at the window. Crouching low to the ground, the wolf stares menacingly, stalking her every move. She alone sees the threat to her life. Her mother honestly did not see it. Rachel's dream was eerily reminiscent of the song that seven-year-old Cheryl Downs heard just before her mother killed her, hungry like the wolf. Children cannot survive the terror of knowing that they are living with a mother who can emotionally devour them. They experience the terror unconsciously in their dreams. Rachel saw the wolf outside. The real danger, of course, was inside. As long as children are trapped, dependent, and unable to survive without their mother, they deny the danger and protect their mother. Rachel's nightmares finally stopped during her freshman year in college, when she was 500 miles away from home. Several weeks after Rachel discussed her childhood dream, I asked her if she avoided eye contact with her mother. Yes, I guess I do, she replied. It's just a habit. I've never thought about it before, but I am afraid to look my mother in the eye. Eventually, Rachel connected her fear of her mother with the wolf at the window. Avoidance of eye contact is an instinctual response to possible attack. Rachel referred to her mother as a fake and felt manipulated when her mother was kind. Sometimes her mother treated her as if she was all good, and at other times, like a worthless piece of trash. When her mother was kind, 
Rachel became suspicious. All I can say is that sometimes the sound of her voice just gives me the willies, you know, like I'm being set up. She'll call me crying and talking real sweet to me, saying, you know I love you, blah, blah, blah. A shiver sets me on edge. This is it. It's no different than the abusive husband who's really, really sorry that he beat you up. If you fall for that line, it's just a matter of time before you're dead. But my God, this is my mother. Rachel accurately identified the parallel between abusive husbands, borderline personality disorder males, and her mother. Men who batter their wives typically express extreme remorse following beatings. Although borderline mothers are less likely than borderline males to become physically violent, emotional abuse and character assassination are equally devastating. The cycle of remorse, anger, and guilt pulls the borderline's children toward the edge of a deadly vortex. Children of borderlines learn to sacrifice their true selves because survival requires that they meet their mother's emotional needs. Masterson defines the true self as a self that is whole, both good and bad, and based on reality. It is creative, spontaneous, and functioning through the mode of self-assertion in an autonomous fashion. Autonomy, the freedom of self-direction and self-expression, is impossible for the borderline's child. Because the borderline mother views separation as betrayal and punishes self-assertion, the child develops a false self. The true self is buried alive. Rachel expected harsh punishment to follow inconsequential mistakes. When she was a child, her mother berated her simply for forgetting her lunch money. Rachel was a perfectionist who felt worthless whenever she made the slightest mistake. She ruminated about decisions, interactions, and minor events. Everything had to be perfect. Naturally, she rarely relaxed. Like Rachel, children of borderlines may never feel safe enough to let go, to be spontaneous, or to play. Winnicott wrote, It is play that is the universal, that belongs to health. Playing facilitates growth, and therefore health. The natural thing is playing. Children of borderlines may be diligent workers who have difficulty having fun. They don't know how to relax or how to feel consistently good about themselves. Searching for Normal Webster defines the act of mothering as to care for or protect. Diane Goldberg describes her experience of being raised by an emotionally stable mother whose own childhood was marred by deprivation. When I turned six, my birthday cake was festooned with sunset pink roses from Mama's garden. The sharecropper's scrawny kid had become a lady in thick canvas gardening gloves. She cooked huge meals for us. She filled our plates and never chided us with tales about what it was like to be hungry. Our bath spewed scent and bubbles, and we never heard the story of how she and her sister stole soap from a filling station in order to get clean. She protected us from the real and imagined monsters of her own past. Bowlby theorized that what is believed to be essential for mental health is that the infant and young child should experience a warm, intimate, and continuous relationship with his mother. However, children of borderlines experience a qualitative difference in their experience of being mothered. Fortunately, most children do not get the willies when hearing their mother's voice. The borderlines' children become experts at deciphering emotional messages that often have hidden significance. As adults, these children may become preoccupied with discovering hidden motives behind the actions of others. An adult child explained, Things weren't the way they were supposed to be when I was a child. Now I'm suspicious whenever things are going well. Adult children may have difficulty expressing themselves and fear that others may take advantage of their honesty. They are never sure where they stand and question whether others mean what they say. As children, what they knew to be true one minute changed the next minute. They search for validation, for others who might confirm their reality. Daniel Goleman describes the task of the emotional brain as focusing attention on threats to survival, to make split-second decisions like, 
Do I eat this or does it eat me? The borderline's children are preoccupied with what researchers call risk assessment, with determining the nature of their mother's state of mind from one moment to the next. It is an unconscious and involuntary process, like breathing. They do not realize they are doing it. A thick wall of denial protects children from seeing what is too terrifying to face. Splitting. The borderline's all-or-nothing thinking results in split perceptions of her children. Because Rachel was an only child, her mother alternated between perceiving her as all good and no good. Brazelton asserts that all parents unconsciously project either positive or negative attributes onto their children. From the moment of birth, characteristics in the newborn trigger unconscious associations of people from the parents' past. Brazelton explains, like the good fairy or the threatening witch of fairy tales, these ghosts can cast favorable or malevolent spells on the child. Brazelton claims that normally, the child's real self draws the parent away from these projections, and the ghosts are banished to the background of the nursery. A borderline mother's projections, however, are intense and may fluctuate wildly from perceiving a child as all good one minute and no good the next minute. The daughter of a borderline mother described the emotional environment of her childhood in a poem she wrote when she was 11 years old. Wind Changing all the time never knowing which way. Some people guess, but then it'll change. So forceful and mean, but sometimes so softly and unseen. Sometimes holding back, then sometimes letting nothing lack. Cooling the hot summer days, freezing the winter rains. Linehan believes that borderlines should not be viewed as different. It is by making these individuals different in principle from ourselves that we can demean them. And perhaps, at times, we demean them to make them different. Once we see, however, that the principles of behavior influencing normal behavior, including our own, are the same principles influencing borderline behavior, we will more easily empathize and respond compassionately to the difficulties they present us with. Children of borderlines should not be led to believe that their experience is normal. Borderlines sense that they are different and deserve validation for their suffering. The intensity of their fear, rage, jealousy, and resentment is not normal. To state otherwise discounts their experience as well as their children's. Validation must be reality-based. A patient who was both a borderline mother and the daughter of a borderline mother asked her therapist how normal people organize their day. Her mother provided so little consistency that the patient never learned how to structure her time. She recalled that when she was a child, her friend's mothers called them in for dinner at the same time every night, whereas the patient never knew when or if she would have supper. Organizing and serving a meal overwhelmed her mother. For years, the patient never understood why people liked milk. Her mother had frequently served spoiled milk or milk that had been left out at room temperature. Discovering the difference between spoiled milk and a refreshing glass of ice-cold milk is an exciting experience. Life can be good. Time can be structured. Goals can be accomplished, but the borderline mother and her children need help in understanding what is normal and what is not. Children know only what they experience. They may not realize that other mothers do not lash out unexpectedly over minor slights, are not chronically upset, depressed, fearful, or overwhelmed. Children have no experience other than their own by which to judge the world and themselves. Unfortunately, the tendency among borderline mothers to split their perceptions of their children leaves their children with distorted impressions about themselves. The way parents see their children is the way children see themselves. Why one child becomes designated as all good and another as no good depends upon the nature of the mother's projections. Male children who are designated as no good may have mothers who were sexually abused by a male. Mothers can unconsciously project their hatred of men onto their sons. Borderline mothers with more than one daughter 
may view the firstborn daughter as a rival for their husband's love. In other cases, certain characteristics of the child may unconsciously remind the mother of a hated or loved part of herself. The origins of a projection vary with each individual mother. Without therapy, the source of the projection may never be understood. No parent deliberately chooses to love one child more than another. The All-Good Child I never understood why my mother was so mean to my sister. She used to tell my sister that she was born evil. Their fights were so awful. I hid in the corner like a coward and tried to comfort my sister later in secret. I felt so undeserving, guilty, and depressed because I'd been spared. My sister didn't do anything wrong. She didn't deserve the way my mother treated her, and I didn't deserve the way she treated me. I wasn't good. I was scared. Three years into therapy, Joanna shed the shroud of secrecy and fear that protected her true feelings about her mother. Like a blossoming flower, she opened up in the safety of the therapeutic relationship. A recent milestone gave her a new perspective. She could see where she had been and where she needed to go. I was putting away the laundry when I noticed that my heart was beating faster than normal. I sat down in the bed and told myself that I should have eaten lunch. A few minutes later, I felt dizzy, weak, and scared. I told myself, don't panic. This is nothing. It'll go away. I kept folding the clothes but was concentrating on my heartbeat. My head felt light, disconnected from my body. My arms and fingers prickled. I was only 40 years old, too young for a heart attack. Joanna called 911. Upon arrival, the paramedics found her on the couch and took her pulse. They checked her blood oxygen level and promptly diagnosed the problem as hyperventilation. Her short, shallow breaths had saturated her blood with oxygen, thus producing the rapid heartbeat, dizziness, and tingling sensation in her hands and arms. Through therapy, Joanna discovered what triggered this episode of survival anxiety. The toy headstone on her birthday cake had been a joke, but Joanna didn't feel like celebrating middle age. Why would her 40th birthday trigger such anxiety? She discussed the possibility that she panicked when she realized that she had never really lived her own life. Time was running out. In subsequent sessions, her anger and resentment toward her mother began to surface. Joanna was an all-good wife and mother. She never disobeyed, never argued, and never asserted her true self. In fact, at the time of her panic attack, she was dutifully repressing her anxiety as she folded the laundry. Like an uncorked bottle that had been violently shaken, Joanna's true feelings exploded. Characteristics of the all-good child Does not develop borderline personality disorder The all-good child does not develop borderline personality disorder because only the idealized parts of the mother are projected onto this child. Other serious psychological conflicts develop, however, because of the mother's need for merger with the all-good child. Perhaps the most devastating psychic conflict the all-good child experiences is inauthenticity, feeling as if those who perceive her as good or competent are mistaken. The all-good child is the parentified child, trained to parent the parent. All good children are typically obedient and loyal, and may function as little therapists in their families. The borderline mother attributes special power to the all-good child to rescue and protect her emotionally. Therefore, the all-good child is entrusted with secrets, enlisted as a surrogate partner, and develops an imposter syndrome that results from being treated as an adult while still a child. The imposter syndrome reflects the underlying belief that the adult child is undeserving, despite external indications of competence. Accomplishments bring no satisfaction because all good children attribute success to good luck or good fortune rather than to their own efforts. The borderline mother unconsciously solicits the alliance of the all good child. She lives vicariously through this child and seeks validation through the child's accomplishments. Without recognizing the child's need for separateness, the borderline mother emotionally merges with the all good child leaving the child feeling devoured. Nevertheless, all good children fear betraying their mother 
and therefore betray themselves. The all-good child may be too uncomfortable and guilt-ridden to say no to her mother's demands for closeness. De Becker calls forced teaming one of the most sophisticated manipulations used by con artists and criminals. Forced teaming is an effective way to establish premature trust because a we're-in-the-same-boat attitude is hard to rebuff without feeling rude. The mother unconsciously forces teaming by enticing the all-good child with comments such as, you're just like me, or no one else understands me like you do, or you're the only one I can depend on, or if it weren't for you, my life wouldn't be worth living. The mother's need to merge with the all-good child can drive the guilt-ridden child away. The all-good child is treated as an idealized part of herself. Consequently, she cares for the all-good child according to her needs, rather than the child's needs. When mother is cold, she makes the child wear a sweater, regardless of how warm or cold the child feels. If the child rejects the sweater, the mother feels rejected and scolds the child. De Becker points out, however, that anyone attempting to establish rapport should be seeking to put the other person at ease. A parentified child intuitively knows that her role is inappropriate and is terrified knowing that she is solely responsible for her parents' happiness. She should never be placed in the impossible position of being responsible for her parents' life. Is anxious, depressed, and guilt-ridden. All good children repress awareness of their true feelings and consequently are likely to suffer from depression and anxiety. Because they are preoccupied with the emotional state of others, they have difficulty experiencing pleasure. Although they are acutely perceptive, they lack insight into their own psyche and may be unaware of subtle depression. All good children may suffer from gratification guilt, a gnawing ache that accompanies experiences such as vacations, holidays, or parties. They do not feel entitled to their mother's idealized perception and may feel undeserving of a good life. They feel as though they have already been given too much and do not feel entitled to having more. They may compulsively provide for others what they need for themselves. Glickauf Hughes and Melman report that non-borderline daughters of borderline mothers worried greatly about not being able to please their mothers. Consequently, the all-good child is susceptible to emotional depletion because of compulsive approval-seeking behavior. In addition, the tendency toward depression, anxiety, and guilt is common among all-good children. They can feel overwhelmed with responsibility for caring for others, yet not deserving of being cared for themselves. They have difficulty articulating their feelings and needs, and are extremely uncomfortable with recognition and attention. Although all good children need therapy as much as no good children, they are not as likely to seek treatment. Glickauf, Hughes, and Melman note that non-borderline daughters of borderline mothers have difficulty distinguishing normal feelings from more primitive feelings and tend to confuse feelings with actions. They fear becoming like their mothers and associate the expression of strong feelings with the behavior of a borderline. They may restrict emotional expression, appearing to be calm and easygoing. Internalized anxiety, guilt, and depression may therefore go unnoticed and untreated. Tends to be successful professionally. All good children become successful adults, but are not necessarily happy. A preoccupation with doing the right thing can suffocate the real and creative self. All good children can tolerate unreasonable bosses, unpleasant work environments, and unhappy marriages because meeting the expectation of others is more important than their own happiness. They may have plenty of fame, wealth, or success, but rarely have fun. All good children continue to function in a parentified role in adult relationships and tend to be conscientious overachievers. They are often overcommitted and emotionally preoccupied because they fear disappointing others. They simply cannot say no. Minor mistakes can trigger a catastrophic plunge in self-esteem, and internalized anxiety prevents them from enjoying their accomplishments. The emotional energy of the all-good child is heavily invested in avoiding mistakes that could shatter the foundation of the self. 
Although all good children do not act on suicidal wishes, when the self is shattered following a minor mistake, they may think to themselves, I wish I were dead. Success can trigger panic attacks in the all-good child. The more successful they become, the more anxious they are. All good children experience little contentment or peace of mind, especially if they believe that a no-good sibling was sacrificed. Messages to the All-Good Child You are the only one who can make me happy. Without you, life isn't worth living. Don't ever leave me. You are special. You are responsible for my happiness. You are responsible for my life. Whereas no good children have a fear of rejection, all good children have a fear of success. Because the all good child was spared the abuse experienced by the no good child, success triggers shame and guilt rather than pride and joy. All good children who witnessed the abuse of the no good sibling may struggle with the survival guilt. One of Joanna's journal entries illustrates the depth of her pain. I read an article this month in Time magazine that made me sick to my stomach. The article was entitled War Wounds and included a picture of a 13-year-old girl whose arms had been hacked off by a band of rebels in Sierra Leone. Her family wept for her and is helping her learn to eat with a makeshift prosthesis. She was quoted as saying, I had no idea why they did that to me. I wanted to write to that little girl and tell her how lucky she is that she still has her soul and a family who loves her. She reminded me of my sister, except my sister wasn't so lucky. She, too, was maimed in a civil war that raged behind closed doors in suburban America. I had no idea why my mother kept hacking at her until there were only pieces left. My mother destroyed the one part of a child that can never be replaced. And forty years later, my sister still struggles to survive. There is no prosthesis for a human soul. No one gets it because her arms aren't stumps. No one wants to read about that kind of war. No one seems to realize how many children are being maimed right now in wars that rage behind closed doors all across America, and nobody knows how to help people who have a stump of a soul. Veterans of war know that survivor guilt can rob an individual of feeling entitled to living. All good children can feel so guilty about having been spared the abuse experienced by the no-good sibling that they become compulsive caregivers, compelled to rescue victims of oppression, illness, injustice, or mistreatment. They do not realize how they were damaged by witnessing the destruction of a sibling. Although all good children do not develop BPD, their hearts were pierced with tiny fragments of shrapnel. They feel sad and guilty without knowing why. Slowly, over time, Joanna addressed her own victimization. She uncovered a great deal of buried anger about how much she had sacrificed for her mother and deep sadness about not being able to save her sister. She had served her time enlisted in the service of her mother. The war was over. If it were possible to X-ray the self of the all-good child, one might find a porcelain soul with tiny fractures. Although outwardly appearing uninjured, a child with a fractured soul lives with an inner sense of fragility. The internal self is at war with the external self. All good children suffer silently, unable to articulate the source of their pain that is too deep and too old to identify. Although a fractured soul cannot fully mend, the all-good child learns to protect it from further injury. Defenses such as denial, repression, and sublimation keep awareness of their pain at bay. While all-good children need therapy as much as no-good children, they are unlikely to seek treatment. Analytically oriented therapy is the key that ends the inner war and opens the door to enjoying life. The No Good Child Sometimes I get really confused. I don't know what to blame. What do you do when it's 2 a.m. and you're sitting outside smoking a cigarette and you want nothing more than to poison the soft minds of America with all the dirtiness and black that is you? 
to take away their television sets and replace them with thoughts of fratricide and self-doubt and apprehension. Sometimes I want to be a loathed and feared god who sits on top of the ugliest mountain in green clothes. I want to look at this farce, this capitalistic and jerky orgy from above and laugh and laugh. I never wanted to be down in it and so, so coated with it. Katrina hated her life and herself. She wondered why, in the middle of the night, she felt blood rushing to her hands and fingers, the physiological reaction to anger needed to grasp a weapon, strike a blow, and take a life. She thought she had grown immune to her mother's vicious verbal attacks. Living with her mother, who picked on her relentlessly, filled her with anger that Katrina could only experience alone at night. The dreams she recorded alternated between suicide and homicide. Chronic psychological degradation of a child or an adult can have deadly consequences. Katrina retreated to her room following arguments with her mother. There, she sliced herself with razor blades and wrote down her feelings. Katrina's journal was literally stained with her own blood. Characteristics of the No-Good Child develops borderline personality disorder. It is only a matter of time before the borderline's no-good daughter becomes a borderline mother herself. The negative projections of the borderline mother grounded the no-good child's self-concept in self-hatred. Children who are perceived as evil by their mother have two choices. One, to believe that they are evil, or two, to die trying to be good. The mother's perception is immutable. No good children can never win, no matter how hard they try. Without intervention, no good children inevitably develop BPD. Typically, they become involved with drugs and alcohol at an early age. Their school performance reflects their negative self-view and their sense of hopelessness. Flagrant acting out, such as antisocial behavior, stealing, drug abuse, promiscuity, and running away, reinforces the mother's belief that the child is no good. Masterson explains that parents will say that their adolescent has been enticed away by bad companions, not driven by conflicts at home. The borderline mother vehemently denies her role in the child's behavior. She honestly does not see it. Suffers from pain agnosia. No good children may develop pain agnosia, the lack of pain response. 75% of abused children in one study showed self-destructive tendencies, such as trichotillomania, compulsive hair pulling, falling, nail biting, head banging, eating indigestible substances, swallowing hard objects, and ingesting pills and medicines. Children who were transferred to non-abusive environments, however, terminated these behaviors, and a normal response to pain returned. The no-good child, therefore, appears to be indifferent to punishment, increasing the mother's rage. Pain agnosia occurs as the result of the release of a brain opioid called metencephalin that induces euphoria and provides an anesthetizing effect. The effect is reminiscent of the dreamy look in the eyes of limp kittens being carried by the scruff of their necks, much more research is needed to discern whether or not self-destructive behavior in abused children serves to release mind-numbing anesthesia that might in fact be an adaptive response to an abusive environment. Feels doomed. Katrina referred to herself as a cancerous growth in her family. Masterson reports that some children of borderlines felt that the only way they could please their own mothers was to kill themselves. No good children feel marked, doomed for life, like a blight on the face of the earth. Their pervasive sense of hopelessness is conveyed in their artwork, their writing, and their behavior. Therapists theorize that the black holes that are commonly depicted in the artwork of borderline patients represent the emotional abyss of emptiness and loneliness. Several adult patients with BPD reported seeing the image of a black star whenever they felt hopeful, such as at the beginning of a new relationship. These patients explained that the black star represents the futility of hope. No good children see no good in themselves 
in the world, or in their future. They feel certain that they will ruin good things, good people, and good times. When they wish upon a star, they see only darkness. No good children see no hope. Messages to the No Good Child You ruin everything. I'd be better off without you. You are responsible for my unhappiness. You make me sick. You are sick. I could kill you. You are a disgrace to this family. Of all the tragic aspects of No Good Children, perhaps the most heartbreaking is their continued desire to please their mother. Bowlby explains that even when the attachment figure elicits fear, children are likely to cling to the threatening or hostile figure rather than run away. No good children may stay attached to their mothers and give up on themselves. Unfortunately, by doing so, they give up hope of feeling loved. An X-ray of the no good child's self might reveal a slow-growing tumor consuming the soul. No good children are afraid of looking at themselves, especially of looking within. They sense an internal darkness, something withered and black, foul and rotten. Whatever it is, it feels beyond their control and is too terrifying to face. No good children who come to therapy, therefore, must have a great deal of courage. They must be willing to look at their withered soul and let it be nourished in the warm light of acceptance and understanding. The Lost Child He would never have seen a therapist. He just didn't think his life was worth it. Bob was the kind of guy who was everyone's buddy. He'd give you the shirt off his back. That was his problem. I used to get really angry with him when we were teenagers. He was so smart, but he never applied himself. All he wanted to do was hang out with the guys and play basketball. He gave up on himself long before he died from the overdose. Mary came to treatment shortly after her brother's death. Her sadness was tinged with anger about a life cut short, a life not lived. The lost child is like an empty shell that is tossed to shore or swept to sea. Either way, it is lost forever. Surviving the mixed messages of the borderline mother requires the ability to ride the waves of emotional upheaval. Lost children survive by floating, by resigning themselves to having no control. Lost children are confused about who they are and resist being controlled by authority figures. They have difficulty keeping a job, following through on commitments, or being responsible. They may numb themselves with drugs or alcohol and stay detached from their emotions. Like Peter Pan, they feel motherless and never grow up. Lost children are strongly defended against attachment. Neither personal possessions nor relationships are perceived as necessary for survival. Although lost children can be friendly, fun, and affable, they have difficulty being reliable, consistent, or dependable. They avoid commitment of any kind. Underneath the lost child's easygoing demeanor is cynicism about life that feels meaningless and empty. Lost children may seem carefree, but they are not happy. They live on the fringes of society and play by their own rules. They can easily end up on the streets, homeless. Family members may not see them for years and often state, I don't know where he is. I've lost track of him. Lacking any sense of self-worth or meaning in their existence, lost children slip in and out of relationships barely being noticed. Children of borderlines cannot become healthy, autonomous adults unless they find a way of understanding their experience. Describing early experiences in words is difficult because memories are stored in the amygdala as rough, wordless blueprints for emotional life. Like children who are born deaf and blind, children of borderlines have no way of organizing their emotional life. They do not realize that they are different that other children are born into a world of sound and light. The lack of consistency in their emotional world creates a sense of meaninglessness, as if life itself is nonsense. Therapy helps children of borderlines organize and express their feelings, and helps them find meaning in their own existence. The therapist may feel like Anne Sullivan Macy, the teacher who patiently taught Helen Keller how to communicate through sign language, but first had to teach Helen the meaning of words. Before she understood the meaning of the word water, 
Helen Keller had no words to describe her experience of the world. She explained, I was without compass or sounding line and had no way of knowing how near the harbor was. Light, give me light, was the wordless cry of my soul. Children of borderlines search for light in their darkness. The Boston philanthropist, Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe, once pleaded for support for a deaf and blind woman, stating, Can nothing be done to disinter this human soul? It is late, but perhaps not too late. The whole neighborhood would rush to save this woman if she were buried alive by the caving in of a pit. The chance is small indeed. But with a smaller chance, they would have dug desperately for her in the pit. And is the life of the soul of less import than that of the body? Masterson's words regarding the treatment of borderline adolescents and their mothers echo Dr. Howe's. Therapy is arduous, time-consuming, filled with obstacles, but it is far from impossible. When it is pursued faithfully, it more than justifies the effort, providing, as it does, a life preserver to rescue and sustain the deprived and abandoned in their struggle, and eventually a beacon of light to guide them. Feeling buried alive is normal to the borderline mother and her children. Without help, they cannot be saved. The father, however, can make a difference. As Freud once said, I cannot think of any need in childhood as strong as the need for a father's protection. The father's character structure can either reinforce the pathological dynamics between mother and child or provide a healthy counterbalance depending on the degree to which he experienced healthy love in his own childhood.